what are we going to be discussing tonight? So we're going to explore the history of reproductive rights and the aftermath of the Dobbs decision. We're gonna discuss the repercussions of overturning Roe v. Wade and how to forge a path ahead in the fight for reproductive justice. All right, let's start with some opening lines. So collective care is the idea that communities are responsible for the emotional and at times physical well-being of their members. As people lose access to reproductive health care, the emotional support of their communities is all the more important. Think about a time when you needed support. Who did you reach out to? Who do you go to in times of need? Uh, we'll write for about five minutes and you can send your responses directly into the chat. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our teaching artist. Merle Hoffman, born March 6, 1946, is an American author, activist, and feminist healthcare innovator who has been on the front lines of the reproductive rights movement since 1971, when she helped to establish one of the first abortion clinics in the United States two years before Roe v. Wade. She is the founder and CEO of Choices Women's Medical Center in Jamaica, Queens, which provides abortions as well as prenatal care, all options counseling, gynecological visits, mental health services, and trans health services. The publisher and editor-in-chief of On the Issues magazine, 1983 through 99, and the recipient of the 2009 News Women's Club of New York front page award, Hoffman is also the author of two books, Intimate Wars and Choices, a post-Roe Abortion Rights Manifesto. The co-founder with Francis Kissling of the National Abortion Federation, Hoffman has organized crucial actions in the history of the reproductive rights movement and remains a crucial provider and activist in the post-Roe era. Yes, give it up for Merle. So excited to have you today. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I love your organization and everything I found out about it since you invited me. And I so enjoy just the, uh, the the music that you put on, which I had a hand in picking. And music has been a great part of my life. And I think everyone's because it allows, you know, our emotions, which are so powerful to be expressed in that way that everyone can share. And I so much uh, like your right for our lives, right to life, but it's a W for writing because it is the power, really, the power of our lived lives that creates the energy, the rage, and the creative insights, all of the creative insights that will become the sacred fuel to you to change your world and in a sense, hopefully change the world from what it is to what it should be. So writing is, is critical, critical. Um, I've been traveling the country, uh, part of it anyway, in the last few weeks to support my new book, Choices. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, aside from wonderful country music and fried, great fried chicken, I mean, this is one of the states that as soon as docs came down, they had a trigger law that immediately banned all abortions. No, no exceptions, even to save the life of the mother. Uh, so this was really in the belly of the beast, okay? And uh, what's interesting in the legislature, they're actually attempting to pass a law that I think starting from grade school all the way up through high school, students will be forced to observe a three minute video called Baby Olivia. Now you may think it's about a baby, but it's not. It is about a fetus and it's a little, you know, uh, anomic uh, icon of a fetus. I haven't seen the film but I suppose it's going through growing and then comes an abortion and, you know, but this, this is now being proposed as required watching. Um, and as I was going around the, the country and speaking to different student groups, 
I, I experienced a tremendous desire to engage and to learn. And I also learned that there was a great lack of knowledge about the history of the reproductive rights movement and the current reality of the politics of what's happening in the reproductive rights movement. And I can't just blame the students for that because what's happened is that our history, when I mean our history, your history, the history of women, you know, in all our myriad of expressions and lived lives has been hidden or not only hidden, just it, it kept, kept from us. So uh, it is so critical that we write and it is so critical that we also read um, and, and express what our current reality is. You see, because there's a saying that it is the winners who write the history. And we are in a war. We are in a war for women's fundamental human and civil rights. And unfortunately, the narratives, you know, what I call the outposts in our heads, are not being written by us. They are being written by the opposition. So it comes to having you know, little videos of fetuses running around, uh, the whole idea that uh, abortion is killing and uh, killing a child and a terrible thing, and women shouldn't have that right. And looking at what happened recently with the IVF, you know, in vitro sterilization debate, where they say even a sperm and an egg, because it has the image of God, you know, they can't do this. We need to do this. Fortunately, we have fought that, and, you know, that's not that's not gone on totally. Um, so I am um I am now in my 53rd year, 53 years of this movement. That means I was 25 years old when I started this. And well, let me take you way back to that time in the 1970s. And actually that Helen Reddy song that we first heard, I am woman, hear me roar. I couldn't help singing along with it, you know, was written during that time. And um, so we go back to the 1970s. There was no social media. There was no internet. There was no smartphones and there were no women's sports and women could not get a uh, credit. You had to get either your husband or your father signing for you to get a credit card. That was in 1970, when I was about 24 and 25. And before 1970, you know, Roe v. Wade, the legalization of abortion was passed in 1973. But before that, in 1970, there were five states that legalized abortion. That was New York, Washington, Hawaii, and Alaska, and DC. And think about this, okay? One day, abortion is illegal. Let's say it's Monday, and abortion is legal. And it's the worst thing a woman can do. It's a horror, it's a sin, it's a crime. I mean, millions of women have laid their lives down to attempt to have one. But on Tuesday, it's legal. <laughs> it's legal. I mean, that is, when you talk about a revolution, I don't know of a more radical change in reality than that change. Now, okay, so 1970, think of this, abortion is legal in New York. In that year alone, 287,000 women travel to New York to have legal abortions. In that year alone. And um, it made me think of how many women throughout the decades who were pregnant didn't want to keep their pregnancies but didn't have the ability to terminate them in a legal and safe way. Now, 1970, just 69, 70, 68, maybe were, were the beginning of the burgeoning women's uh, uh, liberation. So there was, there were big marches prior to 1970 for abortion rights, which I didn't participate in. And, uh, you know, there was the consciousness raising groups uh, because I was 
um, not involved at all in politics. Actually, I was studying to be a concert artist. So most of my days were spent practicing four or five hours a day. Um, I was a bohemian, I was an artist, and I didn't take my SATs. I didn't go to college till I was 22 because I was gonna be a great artist and that was irrelevant to me. So I decided I would go to Paris to study, which I did. And I always laugh and say it was where I learned to love bread and cheese because that's all I ate for about eight, or that's all I could afford. Okay? And then um, I had to come back to New York because my father got ill and I was about 21, almost 22. And I really realized it was not going to continue with that world, with that, with that, uh, uh, you know, being a pianist, a great pianist. And thought to myself, well, I'll, I'll go to college. <laughs> I'm interested in psychology. So I went to college and I got a degree undergrad in, in psychology. And then I went to graduate school and I was working three jobs at the time to put myself through school. And one of those was with a physician that started a small practice for the community, we were talking about community and caring for our community to provide legal safe abortions and asked me if I wanted to get involved. And I, I didn't know anything about abortion at all, but it was actually very interesting, pioneering, romantic. And I said, yes, I get involved, I'll get involved. So basically I helped to open, to create and to form one of the first legal abortion clinics in the country. And I like to say I'm one of the midwives of the women's health movement, which now has been really almost lost in the United States. And just to give you an idea, in some of our busiest years, we would see almost 40,000 patients a year. So if you looked at what was done during that time, almost 5% of all the abortions in the country were being done by choice as a feminist medical center in Jamaica, Queens, New York. So that's why I say my feminism and my commitment came and still comes from the ground up, from my experience, from my experience. So Freud said that anatomy was destiny. Elizabeth Hardwick said biology is destiny, but only for girls. Now with Dobbs, geography is destiny, which means depending where you live, you are a second class citizen in this country. Because if you can access a fundamental human and civil right, which is reproductive justice and reproductive freedom, you are a second class citizen. And I consider myself a second class citizen because as long as one woman is in this country, we all are. So don't think there are safe places or you're safe, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody is safe at this point. So I want you to know what's happened. Some of the things that happened since the Dobbs. Um, well, I say is almost 24 million women lost their uh, fundamental human and civil rights. That's a swath of states throughout the South, basically. And anti-abortion physicians are suing to curtail access to the pill. Mifepristone, just this week, if you uh, looked at the papers, you would see that there were tremendous demonstrations outside of the Supreme Court. Anti-abortion physicians are trying to stop mefepristone, which is the first part of the, the pill. And actually, I was very pleased to see that some of the women from the Women's March were out there getting arrested and they were getting a little more radical. That was very, very pleasing to me. Um, a recent report in JAMA, uh, which is a medical uh, journal, estimates that nearly 65,000 pregnancies that were the result of rape have been carried to term. They've been carried to term. And Kate Cox, uh, if you watch the uh, the president on State of the Union, she was in the, in the box with uh, Jill Biden. This is a woman who was carrying a fetus that was practically dead. They would not allow her to, to have the abortion, but insisted that she actually give birth to this partially dead fetus that would only live for two hours, 
which it did. She held it in, in her arms as it died. And this is because of these laws. Um, and you know what's going on with IVF. And uh, again, the trigger bans like uh, Tennessee are, you know, going into effect at choices we were seeing about five to 10 to 15 patients a month from out of town, now we're seeing about that, uh, about 15, 10 to 15 a week. And so, you know, mainly young girls and women who don't have any money. And fortunately, there are feminist uh, funding uh, and groups that help them. But it's, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous hardship uh, for that. So I don't believe that anatomy is destiny. And you don't have to be a woman to be a target of misogyny and have the right of domain over your body attacked. I do know that Dobbs has pushed us back decades and it will require many more decades to get back to even where we were. And you really have to understand this. It's not going to be a vote in Congress. It's a, it will take a very long time and one thing that I've always, always said, and that's important to remember, that abortion is a mother's act. The majority of women who have abortions are mothers. And when you are pregnant, you are a mother. So abortion is a mother's act. It is also an act of love. And I just really like to quote uh, Che Guevara on this. And he says, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that the true revolutionary is motivated by great feelings of love. Okay? I agree. My book is dedicated to my first patient, and her name was Helen. I consider myself a warrior healer, W-A-R-R, -R, <laughs> warrior healer. And I'd like to read uh, from my book. A couple of a couple of pages. Um, so this is about Helen. Helen came from New Jersey because in 1971 abortion remained illegal in, in Jersey and most of the country until the Roe ruling in 1973. She came in with her husband and one of her three children. I remember she was visibly shaking with anxiety. Dr. Gold said to me, go in and talk to her. Go in and talk to her. I was nervous too. No one had trained me. Legal abortion was an uncharted course full of morality, theology, philosophy, and politics, all topics I'd studied, but I had no experience in dealing directly with the abortion patient herself. No one did, no one did. I thought to myself, what do I say? What do I do? The intellectual giants of psychology came into my mind, but Freud and Jung had nothing to say about dealing with the ultimate question of existence, the woman's and the fetuses, in a medical setting. I went into the room, sat down, and told her up front that this was the first time I had done this. I said, we are pioneers in this new world of illegal abortion. I am going to talk to you about what the procedure involves and the physical, emotional, and psychological aspects of it. But let me first assure you that you are not going to die. You are in a safe professional medical space now. In the early days, abortion meant death or potential life altering complications. Indeed, the very first time I heard about an abortion was when I was about 16 years old. I overheard my parents whispering about a Philadelphia physician whose patient died when he was performing an illegal abortion and to cover it up, the doctor cut the woman up and put her remains down the drain. Abortion for many people brought to mind images of death and disfigurement. People have been raised on movies with hard and realistic illegal abortion scenes where women died or were butchered. Helen told me it was impossible to have another child, that her family would be financially broken, and that she psychologically was unable to care for one more. 
I spoke with her husband, who was extremely supportive. At that time, we did not have space or equipment for general anesthesia, which for many years was the reality in most clinics around the country. I told her the pain would be similar to bad period cramps and tried to reassure her. I will stay with you, I said. I remember gently touching her hair and leaning in close and speaking softly into her ear, telling her she was okay, she made the right choice, and that everything would be okay. During the procedure, she was squeezing my hand so hard, I had to take off my ring. I told her to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. I breathed too, matching my rhythm with hers. After it was over, I had the profound experience of being in the recovery room with her as she expressed her relief and gratitude for just being alive and not pregnant. It was another epiphany. This is not a career. This is not a job. This is a mission. And there was always another, another woman or little girl, another face, another set of wide, eyes open wide with fear. There was in those early days so much fear, but the ability to look into those eyes and say, it's over, you're not pregnant anymore, was and is a gift to them and to me, because in that moment, their life is given back to them. So I want to talk a little bit about writing. And uh, I remember the first time I ever wrote anything, I must have been about 11 or 12. And it was a poem, and it was a poem about love and death. And I think that's natural in adolescence. <laughs> you know, very, it was romantic, love, and I'm dying, and, you know, the tears on my grave for my love. So that was the kind of thing I did. And I do remember I got some kind of award for creative writing in uh, high school. And, uh, and then most of my writing was academic or necessary for classes or, or whatever. But it was um, only in uh, 1976 where the writing and the politics and the sacred fuel of rage came into me because that was when Henry Hyde cut off Medicaid funding for poor and black women. And nothing was done. Nobody was screaming in the streets. But these were the majority of my patients. So when I heard about it, the first thing I did was to write. You see, the first thing I did was to go up to my desk. I was so angry. And then I had this one page, you know, pamphlet, polemic. And, and then I said, well, now I, what do I do with this? You know, it's just not enough to have the, the words on the paper. So my clinic was close to Queens College where I was an undergraduate. So I went into Queens and I walked down the halls with very many of these papers. And I knocked on the professor's doors and said, may I address your class? And then I went in there and I said, women's rights are in a state of emergency, right? And they looked at me like, what? You know, they said, Medicaid has been cut off for poor women. You know, they will not have the right to make a decision. And these are the women that suffer most. And the reaction was big shrugs of shoulders. Well, you know, I can always fly here. I can do this. I can do that. And these were mainly white and middle class kids. And that was the moment that I really was faced with the the racial and class divisions within the society and very much within uh, the movement. So remember, in every revolution, it's the writers who put our dreams and imaginings into the world. The French Revolution immediately they started to write pamphlets. You know, the the uh, tennis court. It's written. It's always written. And so I decided to write, and I found the first edition. Can you see this? <laughs> of my magazine <laughs> on the issues in 19, <laughs> it's hard, 1983. And my editor, see, the photo is about a patient checking in at the reception desk to show the friendliness and the caring. And my editorial is about the Hyde Amendment. And then I have something about the AIDS alert because the AIDS situation was just starting. 
something about premenstrual system, patient power, and my debate with Cherry Falwell. So I started on this. This is how it started. And I sent it out free to everybody I knew. I, I got mailing lists and sent it out to doctors, women's organizations. And, you know, people, and people just started to send me money. You know, this is great. Do more. They just started sending money. And then I spoke to well, a couple of friends and a, a cousin of mine. And uh, let's turn this into a magazine. And then we did. And it became an extraordinary magazine. And Jen Baumgart actually has worked and written for it. Andrea Dvork and all, all of the great early radical feminists. And what's so special about On the Issues, I had no constituency. I let the writers just write. And things that they weren't able to publish in other feminist journals because, you know, oh, we'll go, we're going to upset this group or that. That wasn't me. And everybody could just write. It hasn't been alive now, but I've just redone the website and we have a phenomenal treasure of past issues that I'd love you to look in. Just go into ontheissuesmagazine.com and, uh, you know, so much history there. I, I actually, it's its own library. So um, in closing, I, in closing for this part, um, I want to share a bit of my manifesto because that's what the book is called, a post-abortion rights manifesto. And a manifesto is to set out your goals, your vision, your dream, what you want to see, what has to happen. It's a serious set of principles. So these are some of them, okay? And one is the right to legal safe abortion is the front line and the bottom line of women's freedom and liberty to Feminism is the theory, abortion is the practice. Three, we must accept our current legal reality, but we cannot normalize the loss of so many women and girls and people not having human and civil rights. You must speak out and do whatever you can every day. If you've had an abortion, speak about it. You know, try and open up to your family or your friends. I've had an abortion. I had it when I was 32. I could not have a child at that time. When I was 58, I decided I was ready and I adopted a little one, Siberia. But it took me that long. The point is you have to be ready and you have to make that choice, okay? Um, and Flo Kennedy, and there's many more, but I want to get back to you, to your program. But Flo Kennedy, a great radical uh, black first pay, uh, black woman who graduated from Harvard Law, always said, "Girl, you have to love the struggle." So I want to tell all of you, it is a struggle. It will give your life meaning, purpose. And great joy at times, aside from all the despair and frustration which you have to get over, you know, mourn and then organize, which is what I do. So I'm telling my stories to you, and I, I hope and expect that you will tell your own throughout your own lives. And uh, I just thank you again so much. And uh, Choices, again, has multiple intern programs, ways you can get involved. And uh, now... I think I do a, a writing prompt, is, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, so here's the writing prompt. Merle, if you wanna introduce it. Okay, um, let's see. Think of a time, let me get this away from it. Okay, think of a time when you, not a parent, not a doctor or other authority made a decision about your body or your life it could be the first time you felt that control and responsibility, but it doesn't have to be. Shall I read it again? Or it's on the people see that, right? Okay. Yeah. All so right. we'll write for about five minutes and then we'll have a space for people to share if you feel comfortable. Part of the curtailing of abortion rights means that women have to make a case or why they deserve an abortion. Imagine you are seeking an abortion and are arguing your case to a doctor or another authority. What would you say? So 
So now uh, it's time for the Q&A. If you have a question for Merle after her wonderful discussion of her book, her career, what brought her to reproductive rights and abortion rights, um, you can either raise your hand or type your question in the chat. Sarah Moores asks, when does your book come out? Sarah, my book is out. It is out and about in the world. Uh, I think it, um, about three months it's been out. I wrote it last year during an eight month period because it was so important to get it out. So I, it's available and we can get one to you, I believe. If you, I, I think something has been set up for this event. Uh, so I would like to give the participants the ability to get this book and uh, love you to read it. Yes, we will be sending a form in the chat Good. short, like after this Q&A for you to sign up if you want to get a free copy of Choices. Yes, I want I want to, to give them out free because uh, I want to spread the word. Yes. Um, and then Kylie asks, are there any opportunities that you know of for high schoolers and college students to spread awareness for abortion rights, maybe internships, papers, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, definitely. Our choices, we have lots of ability for uh, interns. I have a very strong outreach program. We go into prisons, we go into schools, we talk to, we have kids come in from other types of organizations. You can work in marketing, you can work in outreach, you can work in some of our politics. You just send in your information and we'll get back to you and we will definitely find a place because everyone has some ability to give to this movement. Don't think you have to march 24 hours a day or do what I, you just do what you can, but do something, do something. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's the Choices website. Please put a link to the website. And I'd like uh, to put a link to On the Issues to the magazine and also to merlhoffman.com. And again, I want to stress there's so much history and so much wonderful writing, you know, from, from the real, um, I won't say seminal, right, ovular writers of the women's movement. <laughs> You know, let's use some language and ovular writers that go into the Omni issues and, and you'll just, it's its a treasure trove, really, really, really. And don't be afraid if you're thinking of something like that. Remember, I just started a little newsletter and something grows from that. You never know you have to plant a seed and never think anything is impossible. Just that word should not be in your vocabulary. Shouldn't. I mean, look at me, I'm orbiting the earth. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, anything is. I have a question if that's okay. Sure. Uh, you have been a prominent activist for decades at this point. Right. So mm -hmm. I would love to know for you, how has activism changed from the 70s to now? How does it look different? What is the day to day? Very different. Yeah. Uh, you have to understand in the 70s, activism meant physically acting, getting out of the house, either marching or going to, you know, going to meetings, developing rape crisis, center, rape crisis centers, working in abortion clinics, which was thought of as the highest level of commitment you could do. But since, and I can't stress enough, the radical changes that social media has brought. And now the, the activism seems to be on the computer. And yes, it's wonderful that you can write and say like, meet me at, uh, you know, uh, Bryant Park. And, but that's not enough. I mean, that will not change. Look, look at where we are. I mean, 50 years of what we thought was a constitutional right overturned. And I always go to Black Lives Matter movement, you know? I mean, they were out on the street consistency, constantly. And we can all argue about how much that really changed things. But the fact is that everybody was doing that. Everybody, and I don't see anything. I don't see any anything in the streets. I don't hear anything. 
you know, everything is directed towards the election. And I'm not, you know, yes, vote. Yes, we have to, but that's not the answer. You can see that the Supreme Court wasn't the answer. The law didn't save us, didn't protect us. The elections are not going to protect us. The bottom line is that we have to take responsibility ourselves. Now, that's a message that is not very you know, attractive to a lot of people now because really they'd rather be at home on the computer and just liking or not liking or doing. That's not going to do it. I hate to say that's why I have to say it's a struggle and we have to love it because that's what it is. That's what it is. That's the difference. That's a major difference. Major Anybody else have a question? I mean, if there was anything that you were interested in about abortion, didn't have anyone to ask or afraid to ask, you can ask. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, if no one has, going to jump in. Um, so you spoke earlier about you have to love the, the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's very easy to get sad and angry when you look at all the news about abortion and how our rights are being rolled back. Um, so what are some ways that you take care of yourself to make sure you can be sustainable in struggle? Yeah, people ask me, you know, don't you get depressed? Don't you get, of course, I get, you know, there are times I despair, there are times I get dis depressed, but I, I have the deep understanding that this is an ongoing generational struggle, that this is not something you win or lose, that, okay, we won this referendum. That's just a battle. And there are many, many battles. This is a war we're in. And if you look what's happening around the world, women, the, the Taliban just announced in Afghanistan, they're going to reinstitute public stoning of adulterers, women adulterers in the public square. They're reintroducing this, you know? I mean, we're just one part of what is happening to women in this world. And this country used to be the light, you know? I mean, nations look to us, but now we have to look to South America, which is amazingly countries like Mexico, Colombia, you know, Venezuela have decriminalized abortion. So what keeps me going is, first of all, a, a philosophical understanding that I'm not in this to win because I don't see it that way. I'm in this to be, I'm privileged to be a part of what I see as a long-term struggle. And King always used to talk about the art of, ju arc, arc of justice. You know, I don't know where their arc is for women, but, you know, it's a long, long way off. And if you if you put it in perspective, if you don't take it personally, and that's very important, you know, then you can keep going. And that's not to say I need to, you know, to sometimes I feel like I want to get out of the whole thing. It's sort of like a marriage. I can't stand it anymore. I just don't want to be. But I always come back because I know this is this is my life and this is my commitment. And I tell you, it's so good to have a commitment like that, to have the responsibility of a commitment, to have that cause because it gives your life so much meaning. It gives it so much meaning. Thank you so much. That, yeah, you. I feel I feel so energized. Good, good. Let's play that music while we march. <laughs> No, I, I really hope that people do, do have the courage. And I always talk about practicing courage. I didn't just, you know, it wasn't just, a, I, you know, I woke up and I had the courage to do that and go down to Queens. From the time I was a kid, I was always pushing back. You know, kids, I, I always say it's the courage of no. No, I won't. No, I won't. But little by little, we get, you know, put down and put down and put down and authority do this, this way that way but you got to keep that that resistance within you when you see something unfair when you see something that's not right you got to go back to that point of resistance and say i want to stand up for what's right and what's true 
and I don't want to go along with all the other narratives and false facts and BS. Kenna? I had a follow-up question just off of your last response um, and was wondering, uh, yeah, I've read a bit about some of the abortion pill networks in South America that are really inspiring. And I was wondering um, what models you see being used similarly in the U.S. or what's giving you hope right now? Okay. Um, when I co-founded Rise Up for Abortion which was this radical group, but if you may have remembered, we were the only ones out in the street after Dobbs with our big green banners, et cetera, et cetera. We worked extremely closely with the women in South America who developed this green wave. They got their, their countries to decriminalize because of the constant relentless pressure. So we've worked with them now, they have to work with us. But we have to be able to move and to keep that pressure going by constant action. And let me just say this. If Biden, you know, Biden is now, he presents himself as the sa savior of reproductive rights. I mean, so he is not. But let's say he gets into office. We can't leave our feet up on the desk and say, OK, Biden, the Democrats are going to save us. We have to put pressure, 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 because, you know, the Hyde Amendment, after all these years, is still in effect. And Biden and Obama and Clinton could have just by edict gotten rid of it, but they haven't. Nobody is screaming about that. So it really requires pressure or, or else we do not have a democracy or a democratic republic. We really have you know, an authoritarian uh, fundamentalist theocracy, which somebody talked about. That's what we have. And you know, they just put um, the right to legal safe abortion in the French constitution. Has anybody read about that in France? They put it into their constitution. I've been doing some research. This is one of my crazy genes. I don't know. I want to apply for American women to be able to have political asylum in France. Because in France, we can be free to access that service, but we can't in our country. So I've gone out <laughs> to talk to a couple of attorneys and it, it's very complicated, but that's something in my mind, really. Okay, thank you, Merle, for these amazing answers. And thank you to everyone who asked thank a you. question. Um, I think, I feel like this is a great beginning point to continue learning about the abortion rights and reproductive right. rights movement. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, really, really a pleasure. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Not... Don't leave yet. Don't leave? <laughs> okay. Have to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have, okay, so to stay connected with today's guest, Merle Hoffman, we have Merle's Instagram, X slash Twitter, and website on the screen. Um, and we'll also send in the chat. Do you have choices up there too? Choices and on the issues. You want to have that too. Yes, you sent that in the chat. Good. Okay, great. And then Merle is going on a speaking tour in April in New Jersey, New York, Minnesota, and D.C. So please check out this tour to talk about this book and talk about these important issues. Thank you for writing with us. You can follow us on social media at Girls Right Now and visit our website, girlsrightnow.org.